Another episode of Love of Pages, <laughs> as we are all dying inside. Um, <laughs> you'll have to forgive our laughter for the first few minutes here. This is the Geek Elite Media Network's virtual book club, mm-hmm. where a group of friends get together and make each other read our favorite novels or our hopeful new favorite novels. Sometimes we just torture each other, but... <laughs> and... I am Elizabeth. I am joined this week, as always, by the lovely Naima, the jubiltastic Jessica. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and the wonderful Steven. It's me. <laughs> and this week we're starting a new book, uh, picked by Steven this this time. Yeah. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Mm-hmm. By v. E. So before we before we jump in. What are we drinking today? Beverages. We all have have tea. We all have tea. I got a lovely new tea. Me and Steven went exploring in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. shop, And we found this tea place that just had way too much tea. Mm -hmm. Like it was really wonga tea places. And I got called poached pear. And it does taste as good as it smells. So I'm very happy. Oh, good. Yay. (laughs) Jessica, what are you drinking? Uh, Harney and Sons cinnamon and spice. And I added an extra cinnamon stick into it because I felt like being extra. (laughs) It's terrifying. It's already such a cinnamony tea. (laughs) So good. And the cinnamon hating Steven, what are you drinking? How could you? (laughs) No, no. um, Where I would probably normally be drinking a a Harney and Sons like cinnamon tea of some sort. Uh, I with Naima, like she said, we went exploring in Bainbridge over here, um, and we went to Steepology, and so I got one that mm-hmm. was called uh, Mexican Chocolate Tea that I'm going to try Ooh. right now. Yeah, it's good. It's a little bit like <laughs> it, it's like a very mellow black licorice, almost. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely a UT and not most people tea. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> huh. And I am finishing up some Thai tea I made. Thai tea Ooh. is good. Thai tea is wonderful. It's wonderful. Although, while we are drinking tea this week, I, I do think I know what we're drinking next week because it's just all over this book. But Are you guys going to have sp- sparkling, sparkling wine? She mentioned champagne. She- champagne. Yeah, that one. <laughs> sparkling wine. Sparkling wine and champagne are not the same thing, Stephen. I don't know. She- Does that go? They they mentioned they mentioned berries or something and said it was spark like the bubbles on her tongue. And I don't drink, so it's either that or Dr Pepper, guys. <laughs> I know what I'm getting next week. It is not going to be champagne. I'm going to go find just like the most like obnoxious looking sparkling wine I can. Mm. <laughs> Use flavor. <laughs> Go for it. Oh. Yeah, th- th- there are definitely some. <laughs> You're braver than I am, Naima. <laughs> I think men- I will be doing champagne. They mentioned some like uh, some drinks like champagne, and then also a coffee in there at one point. So we'll see what we pull. Yes. Out. A flat white a latte. Mm-hmm. So all those things. We should have done. We should have done the coffee today because we are in fact recording for. The- the first time in daylight. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I can handle more caffeine, guys. If, if you want to see where I was at caffeine <laughs> levels for today already, go listen to, what is it, episode three of um, the Win- Falcon and the Winter Soldier from the Geek Swatch podcast. I yelled a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he was very hyper. He was very yeah, hyper. But okay. Let's go ahead and jump into the book. Uh, Steven, you picked out this book. Why did you choose it? So one of the things that actually pulled me to this book was the the experience of the previous books we'd been doing. So (laughs) the other books that we picked up recently had been um, either timely or, 
just like something different than what we had normally done. But they all had one thing in common, and that was that they were all kind of downers. So we decided, like, I, one of the things that we wanted to do was have something that was a little more upbeat, which I do think this is, but Googling, like, recent upbeat sci-fi fantasy suggested <laughs> this one a lot, and people say it okay. a lot for it being fun to read. Mm -hmm. yeah. so they're not there yet, necessarily, in the book. No. So this is just what I'm going to say. I don't think that books are happy. It's not a thing <laughs> people's lives. Okay. <laughs> you can't gloss over, you know, the darkness and the devil's walking around following you. It's just not a thing. <laughs> That's just about life I in know, general. But I do think, you. I think there are stories that consistently have happy, happy endings as opposed to We've been dealing with a lot of sadder endings, or at least <laughs> we'll have endings. A None of mine will ever have a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, I would say there is there are books that have happy endings, even in the worst Berenstain Bears book, where Brother Bear was having terrible nightmares about the science fiction <laughs> toys that he had. He still turned the corner, talked to Papa Bear, and... He worked through those bad dreams. So both he and Sister Bear were able to have more productive and upbeat lives. At the end of the day, Franklin could still count by twos and tie his shoes. But like, that's not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So first impressions of the book, Naima. Um, so I, I initially started it as an audio book, mm -hmm. which goes against everything in my heart. And then I finally did get uh, the text version and I still ended up having to listen to it as an audio book. But mm -hmm. we, for like the majority part of the book, I thought it was a my choice kind of book because <laughs> we're, we're consistently in a different country. We're consistently in a different time period. And every so often there are just words in there that are like, um, so I think there was one portion where she said her age is 20 and three. And I'm like, this book mm -hmm. wasn't translated. Why did they say it like that? <laughs> it's 23, but French, it would translate to 20 and oh, yeah. three. Yeah. So I was like, and then I had to Google it just to make sure that it wasn't translated. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, really do like the book. Like, I, I think that, like, there's, it does sort of have this. I guess happier air to it. Like there, there, there is this sort of like more darker sort of mysteriousness going on, but it's not like she's sad and depressed the mm. whole time. Like still doing these things, and there's this like sort of situation happening around her or to her that's not the happiest. But it doesn't seem like you know she's impoverished and dying and crying, and she's like letting her life go. You know. It's a very nice women empowerment just in case your life, you know, you sell your soul to the darkness or the devil. You know, there's, a <laughs> there's always, well, and that Prince Charming that will mysteriously know who you are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> after 300 years. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jessica, how about first impressions from you? I, I actually really like it. And I also feel like, this would be one of my choices too because I feel like this book really fits in the new adult genre as well. I don't know. I mean, they don't really do new adult genre. It didn't blow up, but this is basically what it is where it's like written really... It's not written casually. I don't want to like lower the writing because it's written really, really well. Um, it's very accessible. But, yeah. Yes, absolutely. there we go. That's what I mean. It's very accessible, understandable. Like... The, like that's my favorite aspect of young adult novels in general is that it just like gives you the story in a way you just accept it like it doesn't overly explain background it doesn't explain like describe a tree for five pages like yeah. classic novels like it's just like there's a magical tree it's got cool looking leaves you're like awesome i got it they it's got in my leaves. head <laughs> yes. got it moving on <laughs> <laughs> got it moving on and that's very much this because i feel like this is a book that would easily be 800 pages yeah and it's not like it's still a good length it's still a good read but it's not as big as i think it could be because it doesn't need to be that big because you already understand the main character so well after like the first two chapters you've mm -hmm. got 
her personality set. I really like her. I like this idea of somebody born in the wrong century and realizing, oh yeah, I was born in the wrong century because of her curse. I also absolutely love the curse. Because I thought initially reading it, I thought it'd be like the next day people forgot about her. But no, Mm. this immediate, as soon as they leave her, forget about her, is so utterly twisted and horrifying. And the fact that she finds a way... I guess in her terms quickly how to see how that's a good to her benefit and also still be wanting to live life after 300 years like to me it's it's really optimistic <laughs> of life in general <laughs> like oh I'm 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 very much enjoying this this is something I had saw when it came out it was all over book book talk Everybody was talking about this book when it came out. And now I'm like, yes, it does deserve it. Because I honestly probably wouldn't have read it because of how much they were talking about it. I was like, eh. But no, I I see already a third of the way through. I'm like, I see why people are talking about this. I hope it does have an optimistic ending, though. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for you, Elizabeth, Steve, I'd, I'll go okay. last. Because then I, I think if you're okay with it, I can take us through a pretty broad strokes pass over the plot. Awesome. Perfect. Um, Which was the merge to possum. But um, (laughs) (laughs) now I, so the first probably about 100 pages, I was ready to kind of hate this book, Um, to be quite honest. I liked the character, but I definitely felt like I was like, okay, great. So we're just going to go back and forth for 300 years of her Mm -hmm. doing the exact same Mm -hmm. thing. Like, I need something. There's got to be some catalyst forward. I need, so until we get Henry, because I did not read the book jacket, to be clear. I just kind of dived in. So I didn't know where this was going at all. And so like the first hundred pages, I'm like, if this is the whole book, (laughs) I am not (laughs) impressed. (laughs) Like it's, she's a cool character and the writing is very accessible, which is nice. It does that whole back and forth, which often, because at first my big criticism was going to be, okay, if you're just going to give me the 300 years into how she gets to today, where she's comfortable with this curse, you need to start 2014 and then you just need to go back Mm -hmm. and stay back all the way through. Now that we've gotten Henry, I'm like, okay, now it's making more sense as Mm -hmm. to why that is the way it is. Um. I did appreciate, as with Jessica, the twistedness of the of the curse itself, which is very uh, reminiscent of what curses would were, were described as in terms of the old gods mm-hmm. and how the old gods answered your prayers. Yeah, um, which was very appreciative, very very appreciative. I also really, I think, my favorite scene in this first third was the conversation with Estelle right after the curse where Estelle doesn't know her, Mm. but she accepts that she doesn't know her because of a curse. Yeah. And like, it's almost instantaneous. And somebody who's that in depth with the Mm. old gods would have had that kind of recognition of you cursed yourself. Like, I don't know what to tell you, like suck to suck. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I chose not to hear. That's all. Can you say that again? I, I was just saying that, like, if she was like, I can, did you advice? You chose not to take it. I don't know what you want me to help you with now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, I also I also appreciate the fact that she very quickly discovers that the thing that trapped her pre-curse is the thing that really traps her post-curse almost immediately. In that she's a woman. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Because she can't live the free life, even though she is completely free, because she's a woman. So she still can't walk by herself after dark. She still really can only, you know, her only source of income is to sell her body. Mm -hmm. She's still vulnerable to all these things. Um, The other big piece for me is that very clearly 
at least from the get go. And I think, I think we'll see that even to this day, the only reason she says no to the darkness is out of spite. Yep. <laughs> like it was strictly like, she's like, I'm not enjoying this, but I'm going to out spite you. Like watch me. <laughs> It's kind of that mentality when it's like, you can't, you'll cave. And then I feel like most women, if not all women, can feel this. It's like, oh, okay, you think you know everything. <laughs> <One second. laughs> I'm going to suffer just to make you wrong. Like, that is it. <laughs> like, well, you, I don't know a person who hasn't been there where they've been told, you can't do that. And they're like, Oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Really? Really? <laughs> Watch me. Uh, I just feel like there's someone out there that's using that as reverse psychology on some poor lady. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, can't so that she does. And it's like, it's not necessarily a thing that, you know, parents and teachers do to whole life. Yep. students yeah. and children on a regular <laughs> basis. Sure. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a thing. <laughs> manipulation anyway. Yeah. They tell you, you can do things when you're an adult. And now we have taxes and bills. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were definitely lied to about. We were lied to about being adults the same way Addie was lied to about the freedom <laughs> and the answering of her nope. freedom. <laughs> I was never, I was never lied thing. to about this one. The only thing that I, that I feel I was underserved by is how important a credit score was. As far as other stuff goes, I feel like they told me. <laughs> they tell you, but they like rosy it up. Mm -hmm. They're like, being an adult's not great, okay? Careful what you wish for, but also, do you want a car? Do you want to be able to buy your own toys? Do you want freedom? <laughs> yeah. yeah wait till you're 18 <laughs> whoops there's the u.s government no <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm i'm glad that you guys all have enjoyed it in some way shape or form uh for this one i tried to pick something that would be workable for everybody <laughs> uh so no yeah for this one i i was pretty happy that it was more upbeat Initially, I, I was coming off of a real bummer of a book. Uh, it was Recursion by Blake Crouch. It's just depressing. <laughs> and when I first started this one, I was like, no, this one is a downer too. Because <laughs> it really didn't, like, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't see how they were going to take this curse and turn it into her superpower just yet, you know? But they did. And I think that's, that's a nice thing. But honestly, that's something that I feel in my, my normal life. Like, I have ADHD, which is a massive problem for me at some times, but also great. Like, you can still have that thing be that way for you. I don't get to live for 300 years, but hey, you know, that's fine. Um, but do you... Do I what? <laughs> <laughs> but do you know this? I mean, deep down, no. <laughs> I, I do feel like I'll live for 300 years. But no, so for this one, I, I was I was very happy about it. I, I like the things that they're they seem to be setting up with with the book. I do think this would have been an interesting TV show that would have to not treat itself or treat the plot like it did in the book. They would have to show a thing about the other character remembering her name in that first episode. Yeah, and then yeah. do the rest of the story. Otherwise, you would have no one watching it. Mm. It I takes too long to get there. Mm -hmm. I think it could have been there. Like, I watched uh, some, like, short series that had Anna Kendrick in it. That Not the same plot point at all. But, like, every episode is basically her going on a different love quest type things. And it's kind of just those, like, stuck in a moment. Like, the episode is just that episode. And the next episode is her dealing with something else. So I'd feel like they'd approach it kind of a, this is her little encounter with the man at the beginning of the mm -hmm. book. And why it's like that. And you wouldn't really get what the TV show is about until that like last episode. And then there's nothing else after that. And it ends forever. I mean, th I think that's how they would have done it if they did it 15 years ago. I think it's a much harder sell now. But yeah. no, like for this one, um, I guess I should, should I get into the plot for this? I think you should. I think we need to at least get, get the general story out there. So for this one, the character that we're introduced to is uh, Addie LaRue. She has a longer name, but she doesn't like it. So you know what? I'm not going to call her that name. Uh, and she can't call herself that name either. Because she, she ends up making a deal with the devil, or a devil, 
that someone mm-hmm. in her town tells her specifically not to do. They, they go to teach her about magic and gods, like the gods that are just the nature of the world. But they warn you in the beginning not to make any any like of these prayers, these deals after n- the night sets in. Because the, the gods that are out at night are mischievous and bad. I just, I, I'm going to pause real quick because the line is just so perfect. Uh-huh. Never pray to the gods who answer after dark. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's like a prime line. <laughs> when, when they said mm-hmm. that line, I took the, I, I had the audio book playing. I took it into Naima and I was like, I think this sounds like a you book. Played the line for her. And then I was like, there you go. Enjoy the book. I, very odd fascination with gods like, I read American Gods, which was like the first audiobook I ever gave myself permission to listen to. And it was narrated by Neil Gaiman, which is just awesome. And I fell in weird love with it. So, <laughs> like, this the whole idea of like the gods aspect and the not to pray to the ones that, um, that answer after dark was just hilarious. Because I kind of thought of them as like little gremlins, but you know, giant all powerful beings. It's fine. <laughs> so, and Stephen, when what time period does she get this curse, and why does she choose to make this deal? Someone else help me on the the time period because that part is immaterial it's, to me. It's in the past, it's early seventeen hundreds. Okay, when she gets the curse, and she basically gets it because she is a dreamer. And she doesn't want to be the woman of the age. She doesn't want to Mm -hmm. get married, have kids. She describes herself as being a tree and she wants to grow wildly. She doesn't want to be pruned to be, to basically fit in society. Mm -hmm. She wants to be the tree that she wants to be. We get a real stark look at the other women in the town who have just been married off to have children and Mm -hmm. further the existence of humans. And they're described in this very bleak manner as just being gray tired worn down shadows of themselves and all she wants is to be anything but that so she's willing to sacrifice anything she continuously gives more and more in the hopes to curry favor with some god to get away from here we finally get to this part this spot where she's about to be wed she's 23 which is just too old for a person to still be unwed (laughs) and she ends up (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as we're all sitting here at 30 <laughs> so she she ends up going on her this this what would be her wedding day in her wedding dress and burying something in the woods and it's just a little too late when she buries this offering and says her prayer the night has begun to set in and she gets her wish i guess and the terms of the thing that she says are just a little bit too broad so she gets to live out forever, but she'll be forgotten by anyone and or everyone and everything. She can't write mm-hmm. anything. She cannot speak her own name. She can't do anything that would affect the world going forward. Even even so mm-hmm. much, like it even goes so far as if she were to grab something off of a counter and throw it on the ground, that thing would be reformed. She can't do anything mm-hmm. like that. That, that same rule stretches to her writing on anything, burning anything, anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. And stabbing anyone. Mm-hmm. So it just, we, we get to, <laughs> we get to see her have to deal with this situation going forward. Obviously she wanted to go and experience the world. She wanted to travel, get to be more like all of us do, but she's still, like you said earlier, held down by so much just being a woman in this time. But even past that, there's nothing she could do to go forward. Like she, she can't go around. She, she could never even use like to say her drawing or anything like that to make money. The only thing that she gets to use is her body. And I will say, I think they dealt with it very well with that. They didn't mm-hmm. go in. They didn't like game of Thrones it where you just got way too much detail on these things or anything like that. It was really well handled. Yeah. Um, we, we see her go through plagues in there going forward. She essentially dies to the cold, but doesn't die. Uh, she wakes up mm-hmm. in a cart of bodies that are being dragged off. 
Um, th- Which made me laugh because all I could think of was bring out your dad from my <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, no, stop it. This is serious. <laughs> See, and I, was, and I was going, that has to be the most horrific cunt, like feeling in the world. <laughs> That's why I went there because it was so horrifying to think of that I was like, bring out your dad. <laughs> Interesting to listen to because all I could hear was like, I'm not dead. And people were like, what is happening? Yeah. What is, who are you? <laughs> It was like one person who, who's who's like yelling like get back demon kind of thing <laughs> because there's there's a living person crawling out of a cart of dead people, but um, we get to see her go through all of this up until now, which I guess now ish 2014, where she's lived her whole life with this curse and used it to her benefit. She can essentially mm-hmm. take something from somewhere, steal something, or. Uh, go in somewhere, leave this place after having taken something, and the world just basically kind of sorts it out and makes it work out in some way, shape, or form. Whether someone else gets blamed for something, um, the ledger doesn't reflect that this thing was in the inventory, something like that. For the most part, we see that the universe sorts it. If she eats something, if she takes something for herself. Mm -hmm. The only thing with this is, again, she, she's not remembered by anybody. She can't affect anything. That even extends to like you like you had said earlier, Jess, with the plot. Like if if she said hello to you right by the snack machine, and then you walk out the door, you won't remember that person you just met next to that snack machine or anything mm-hmm. like that. She's gone. Um, there's a really cool scene that we have, and th- this is a deeper plot thing, but I really like that she was with. Uh, she's been involved with several people for several weeks, to essentially a day at a time. And there's the, the yeah. one guy that she, um, over time, basically co-wrote a song with. Yeah. Uh, and then another person that we and see has, like, um, they've made A art. woman who started her art. She was the start of the art exhibit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like a person has a whole series of art pieces that were based in their encounter with her. It's, it's really nice. There's some really interesting ideas of how this would work with a person. But um, to finish off the plot part here, she continues to life as is normal for her in this new normal situation, but meets someone who remembers her after she takes a book and tries to bring it back the next day after having stolen it. They remember her trying to steal it. Um, but they, she goes back to that same place and tries to return it in exchange for something else. And the guy's like, yeah, no, uh, you, you, st- stole you, were, you stole that book. I let you go ahead and take it and you can't just change exchange that for something else. And, and she basically be... nearly dies in front of him. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. And so, we're... and then she takes him for coffee. Yeah. yeah. Well, she takes him to coffee and then he... <laughs> <laughs> uh, she buys his coffee. She does mm-hmm. buy his coffee. So, he yeah. buys her hot chocolate because she doesn't drink coffee. Uh, th- there's there's a lot in there that's really interesting that I'm sure we'll get into now, but I I like the pitch of it so far, and I'm curious to see where it goes. Mm-hmm. If, if there's anything else you guys think should be called out in the plot, please feel free. So I think the only add-on is Henry, who is the guy who remembers, mm-hmm. clearly has something else about him because we get a little bit of a backstory on him Mm -hmm. his siblings are both exceptionally successful one's a doctor and a scholar the other is an expert art critic Mm -hmm. but he everybody finds him exceptionally attractive Mm -hmm. yes and alluring yes i should also say he she um there's there's one thing about henry in particular she used to draw this one like handsome figure all the time mm-hmm. that was like the epitome of handsome to her. Um, the devil yeah. character in this that made the bargain with her took on the form of that person. And it seems that Henry is exactly that face. He is slightly different because she does different. point out his differences. That's like, true. and the eye color was the biggest difference was her guy had green eyes and Henry has gray mm-hmm. which i would like to know i do believe is an eye type that shifts to green though in yes, certain light <laughs> it'll shift to green or it will shift to blue depending yeah. on the colors the, the colors that you're wearing and or typically lack or extra sleep hmm. yeah but which he's I'll... been under a lack of sleep too so <laughs> <laughs> 
Like Henry so far is my favorite character and he's been present for like this much of like part of yes. the first book. But there's just something like I like this might just be me like way pulling way past the little tidbits that have been there but when he like prompted her with the question of like what she sees in him like he's obviously feeling like there is a missing piece to his story of Mm -hmm. some and something about her is also i wouldn't say necessarily alluring but there is a reason he is so actively engaged with her Mm -hmm. and she just read him like a book like immediately upon meeting and he was just like nope this is how i find out cool you're Mm -hmm. coming with me (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but I think I know what it is that uh, that he, he picked up on because he talks about it frequently. It's the eyes. Everybody else has a twinkle, and he mm-hmm. describes her eyes as not as having more of a storm in them. Yeah, hmm. and so she is not affected by whatever his curse is, and she yeah. is not affected by what vice versa. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. The the like the fact that they both have a curse going on here is why they like I, I don't I don't know I don't know the metaphor I'm looking for here, but they can't be affected by each other's juju. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, I did yeah. I got to the same conclusion that he is also cursed. Like there's something going mm-hmm. yeah. that is making it so that he is both an outsider but also like he seemingly has everything. Mm-hmm. Like he job he really likes even though we were like well your brother's a doctor and your sister's doing so well and you're just attractive but it's like yeah <laughs> like he's <laughs> happy in his job he's like attractive like to me like what i think is coming which is probably way premature to discuss this is i think someone in his family whether it be his parents or somebody pray to the daytime gods and they all got something much better hmm. yeah <laughs> change for her getting you know don't pray after dark and hers has more of a twist to it i think he's less cursed and more he has there has been some sort of supernatural thing that occurred to him and his siblings you think he's but it is, blessed yeah so i i kind of sort of almost want that he's almost demigod because what he really reminded me of was a muse because like it seems like a he surrounds himself with artistic people. Those people seem to get better from being around him from the very little bit that I got. I really only got a little bit. And like, so that's what he reminded me of was he brings out the betterment in other people, but those other people don't ever stay with him. And he also doesn't have his own niche to make himself. He is just a representation of the artist's dream, not the artist himself. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I was going with Jessica. Yeah, hmm. but I I don't know. It could be a curse too, which say. it would be another form of a Greek curse too. Which is probably why I went. Is that like you'll be utterly attractive and all this, but nobody will ever attach to you. I don't know, but but uh, the only thing I would say to that is that it does seem like Addie is the same kind of thing in that regard. True. Every everyone else true. around yeah. her seems to excel to great heights. Yeah, that's true. I think hers is more like it seemed like from just the beginning part of the book that she realized that's the only way she can make a mark. And she's been actively versus like it was a passive thing where people were just becoming more successful from her being present in their lives. And she was Mm -hmm. like, can't do anything like I haven't been able to. And so she consistently started writing this music with this guy. And there was that whole conversation she had with him. Where it's like, I can't do anything else, but at least I was able to help him do this. Mm-hmm. He's going to club the next day and be like, I wrote this wonderful song. It's the first time this has ever worked out for me. Mostly because it's not his, but he doesn't <laughs> have to know that. And so <laughs> he yeah. benefited his life. And the woman who... I think there was like a small inkling before we got the major um, kind of revelation with Henry that there are loopholes to remembering her Mm -hmm. because uh, the painter, the woman painted the emotion of her. She's an abstract painter. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And she was like, I paint my feelings. And she was basically like, it reminds me of you. Like she didn't say she remembered that woman, but there, there was an established connection that, this thing that I made resonates with you as a specific person. Mm-hmm. Like, no. And so there's sort of that, there's still those loopholes. 
Yeah, which I think is probably also why she surrounds herself with artistic artists. people yeah. intentionally because artists see the world differently and they kind of sort of accept the unexplainable kind of thing. So even if they don't remember her, I feel like an artist would, I mean, just like in this case, would be able to be like, you remind me of this painting. You remind me of this song kind of thing because that's just how artists mm-hmm. think. Like You remind me of a girl that I once knew. No. Yeah. <laughs> we're not going there we don't have time for that no time for that <laughs> oh my goodness but yeah so how did everybody feel about the conversations with the darkness in particular I'm thinking towards the end of this section mm-hmm. in the Marquis Marquess's uh, home mm-hmm. I like this ex- this exchange very much I think this sets the tone for the rest of the book going forward personally yeah I like that the darkness has he's more involved I feel like than any like just God should be like he can go get other souls. Like I do like that they named him Luke because I did watch Lucifer the series and this sort of overly charming, attractive like version <laughs> of the devil that's just there to be charming but also evil is just it resonates. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm honestly I'm so glad you said that because that's how I picture him no matter of the description I'm like it's Lucifer from Lucifer uh, it would it would have been perfectly fine if I just read it but I heard the voice and it's not British and so it kind of like kills it Aww. yeah it would have been so good if it was British but um, <laughs> that whole conversation was like I think it was really insightful not just to her but like you got sort of his reactions in it more. I think I read more into that than the actual words they were saying Mm -hmm. because she started to pay so much attention to his mannerisms. Like there was this whole portion where she gets into how his eyes change with his emotion, which is not a thing that I feel like in books that reference gods or people with supernatural abilities, you really get into how they emote things. It's kind Mm -hmm. of, they're just this omnipotent being and they don't emote the same ways that humans do. But it seems like he doesn't have this, like, like he has a facade of some kind. Obviously, he's running around looking like the man of her dream. But <laughs> just like, to torture her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. His eye can't keep up that facade because it's also like there's something going on underneath. So They're if the he windows to the soul. Yeah, he's not supposed to have one of those. But like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, we don't I mean, quite you, know exactly, exactly them. <laughs> There are many souls, no, <laughs> but um, I like the idea that she was getting to the point where she could recognize, like, when he got angry, this is what happened, and then when he was pleased, why they went dark. Mm-hmm. That was the one that got me the hardest. Like, it it went from being like the facade to straight demon. Like, they mm-hmm. actually like that's how I saw him changing in the moment was when he was happy with what was happening, meaning he was getting his part of the bargain he went like full demon, like his eyes went black Mm -hmm. and it was very hard to like see past that. And I'm like, yeah, if you're sitting across the table from someone whose eyes turn black while looking at you, it's going to change how you perceive that. I mean, she doesn't have positive feelings toward this um, God to begin with, but I think I have a question. Does anyone think that he's actually a God or is this like a trickster type situation? I think both. Because like that's the that was getting me because it's like the don't pray to the gods like the answer after dark. But in my opinion, it's like I feel like those like just from history of like gods and other mm-hmm. like text are those are just tricksters. Like it's not as if like the gods aren't answering at any specific time of day. It's just there are certain types of people with more powers yeah. that are waiting more like on the hunt at certain times of the day i think it's more like trickster god personally yeah like, trickster god I, is what i'm gonna go with too like a loki mm-hmm. or a coyote god or some form of that because the amount of power he does have especially when he takes over the household feels like it's a bit more than just being a gnome or yeah no he's definitely a god um i don't know that i would call him a trickster god um He's pretty and, straightforward. I think he's yeah. like a contracts <laughs> trickster god. 
He like, fits. Didn't read the fine print. Yeah. That's your fault. <laughs> he's a lawyer, God. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a documancer. Document. Well, but even <laughs> and it wasn't even but it wasn't even contract because as he points out, like she couldn't articulate what she wanted. He said what she didn't want. Mm-hmm. She, All she ever said was what she didn't want. The thing I will say is um, that, that is exactly how I try to get Naima to choose food. I knew you were gonna bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, listen, some people have an easier time expressing the exclusions than the actual wish. Because mm-hmm. I feel like if actor, like maybe this is a question for everyone. If you were confronted with a God, not saying that you conjured one up, but if one was just happened to be there and they asked you what mm-hmm. you want, could you articulate exactly what you want in a moment? Because it's yes. not like she had an endless amount of time. But that I, I yes, I can say this one because I I know exactly what I wish for every time I see a shooting star, just in case a shooting star does get grant a wish for me. And it's not a for me thing. So I think that's what makes it easier. See, I think to me that's even scarier because it's like uh, there's no repercussions to at least in like our society or like folklore to wishing on a shooting star. Mm-hmm. Almost Every story having to do with any god, whether it's the ones you pray to after dark or them, there's always a consequence to their specific request. Always. See, and while I could articulate what I would want, I would hesitate in getting the wording just right. So it would probably take me a little bit for for me to articulate it because I would I would be the person who would be like, okay, what's going to be the consequence There's- of this wish? What's going to be the consequence of that wish? Which one can I live with? How do I word it to get a, a consequence? Because I'm going to get one that is most acceptable to me. There, there's, a, there's a thing that they did on um, the, the YouTube channel, kind of funny. They had this kind of conversation one time. There's a, a genie comes up, gives you three wishes. Uh, the third wish should always be don't F me. <laughs> again, the God, they could take that literally. And they're like, I never planned that. Yeah. So it's clear. <laughs> like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like I'd just be like, nope, not worth it. Bad yeah. juju. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Please go away. Ask. People are like, you wouldn't wish for something? No. No. I want to be responsible for something horrible happening. Uh-huh. I can live without getting that like one positive thing so long as I am not responsible for every other horror that follows because of it. There's I- always a consequence. <laughs> yeah, no, I always thought what would be the safest is to wish for. I wish to know the numbers for this whatever date's lottery and for nobody else to receive that number. So I think you I think it is dangerous. So you get a set amount of money. I think you you are getting you're dangerous in the wording of that last part because you're saying nobody get those those numbers. That could include the people pulling those numbers. So there's a technical oh, error. Oh, good call. Yeah. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. My brain went to the darkest possible place. Like, you know, I, like, sometimes I think that some things are set in stone as like fate. So maybe someone else was supposed to get that money. Then all of a sudden they don't get that money. They made a bad deal. All of a sudden, like that person's life has gone spiraling down. And you I'm don't like, get the cure for cancer. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> I can't be responsible for that. Yeah. And you know, if it's like a God that's like Luke or like this darkness, they would come around and tell you about it. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah except that again i i am who i am i don't think i would feel guilt about that because 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 if you're in a situation where the only reason that you survive is because you've won the lottery Mm -hmm. and it's your whole reason for survival Mm -hmm. you weren't going to survive to begin with (laughs) there were other issues like you even if you win the lottery you're not going to survive because the people in those in those types of situations end up in those types of situations and and for whatever group of reasonings not just their actions or their circumstances it's some combination of all of the above but i have a real hard time believing if you've if you're already in that situation i'm not sure that winning the lottery is really going to make a difference in Absolutely. the long run. Uh, so does anyone have any last things they want to say before we wrap up here? <laughs> now that we've completely gotten off topic. That's okay. That's I, podcasting, I, baby. I do 
greatly appreciate the LBGTQ representation in this novel, mm-hmm. which we yes. didn't quite go in, but it, it seems like to me both characters, which naturally if you live 300 years, like of course, you're going to be like, <laughs> who gives a shit about gender? Yeah. <laughs> but it seems Sexuality, like... Sexuality, gender, those are yeah. completely fluid things. Like I've yeah. seen 300 years of history to prove it. Yeah, <laughs> Henry also seems to be bisexual or pansexual, mm-hmm. possibly. So I think that's yay. I'm happy. It's not just one character. That's more my thing. It's not just the one 300 year old character yeah. that of course <laughs> would be some form of bisexual or pansexual. Like it's the other main character. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it just because it's not a token character. They're not like, look, we put in a gay person. You're welcome. And it's yeah. like, they, it's, it's again, it's people. <laughs> so mm-hmm. like, not, yeah. It's not a bearing on, oh, well, you just got to have that one person in the group. It's a- mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I also appreciate that it's addressed not like it's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Like sure. there's, that, there yeah. is no, there is no time spent explaining why or the significance or the importance. It just mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. It just is. But yeah. No, I'm with you. The only thing I wanted to bring up um, was because Stephen, you came downstairs to talk about this once because I said deja vu at some point mm. during the last. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was just like deja vu. I don't know if you actually said this whole thing. I, I said but, two like, of them. Deja, deja, deja su and deja vu. I think it was, and it was like already seen, already known, already lived. And I feel like that is the entirety of the book just wrapped into one. And they did a really good job with whoever came up with that and <laughs> did the proper research so that like, you know, <laughs> they actually use the right words. Mm-hmm. It's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. I had the no, deja absolutely. vu, deja su. Those two I had. That last one, I'm not surprised I didn't remember that. That's a more complex last word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fantastic. All right. So join us next week for part two of the invisible life of Addie LaRue. Hopefully we will all have remembered who Addie is <laughs> after being done with this podcast. Sorry. I had to. I had to. Uh, <laughs> Naima, if people want to reach out to you to talk about uh, translating books and why you would put translations in non-translations, where can they find you? All the time. Um, so I'm currently on Instagram as other pages, other places, and I'm also on Twitter and Instagram as emissionon. And Jessica, if people want to reach out to you to discuss trickster gods, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter as JM Bailey Writes. Please tell me what's your favorite trickster gods. I love <laughs> trickster gods. <laughs> and Stephen, if people want to discuss the uh, latest and greatest teas, where can they find you? You can find me all across social media as some permutation of Peppermint Gentleman. For Twitter, that's Peppermint Gent for short. And you can find me with the rest of Geek Elite Media at Geek Elite Media and our Facebook page forward slash Geek Elite Media. Archived episodes of this podcast and other podcasts can be found on our website, website geekelitemedia.com. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to us on whatever podcatcher you use. And if you've got a few extra dollars, come join us over on our Patreon page. We could really use your support. It helps put this podcast and all the other podcasts together. Until next time, this is the Love of Pages, reminding you to always keep turning those pages. And always remember to... Geek Geek out. Geek out.